We turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul, speaking about himself, says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And we considered last week how it was Jesus himself who put Paul into the ministry. It was Jesus who ordained him. It was Jesus who gave him a certificate of ordination. It was Jesus who strengthened him. And the whole reason was because Paul was found faithful in the little things. If we are faithful in little things, God will entrust the big things, the ministry to us. If we are faithful in material things, God will entrust spiritual riches to us. What type of person was Paul before his conversion? That's described in verse 13. He says, formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. He was a slanderer. He had opposed the message of the gospel. He had insulted and persecuted the Christians and abused the Lord Jesus. Such a great sinner, one who opposed Christ and killed people. And yet, he says in verse 13, I was shown mercy. The first contact that we all have with God is with his mercy. God is rich in mercy. He doesn't come to us with judgment. He comes to us with goodness so that he can draw us to repentance and bring us to forgiveness. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And likewise with the apostle Paul, he was saved through God's mercy. But it says also here that I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. One of the things that the entire Bible makes very clear is that there's a lot of difference between conscious, deliberate sin and that which is done in ignorance. In fact, in the book of Leviticus, we read of offerings made for sin in almost in every case. We read there, this phrase of the sin which they committed in ignorance not knowing there was no provision for deliberate sinning except to be stoned to death now in Hebrews in chapter 10 we read similar words Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 26 if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment, the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So there is a difference between sin committed deliberately and sin committed in ignorance. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.13 that he was shown mercy because he sinned in ignorance in unbelief. He did not know that Jesus was the Messiah. He'd never have opposed him if he knew he was the Messiah. He did not know that these Christians were children of God. He opposed them because he felt they were heretics. Now we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Acts 17, 30, that God overlooks the times of ignorance. And that's the great mercy of God because even if we are ignorant of God's will, we still deserve punishment for disobeying God's will. That's very clear from Luke chapter 12, verse 48. It says there that the one who did not know his master's will and still committed deeds worthy of a flogging will still receive a flogging, though not as much as the one who knew his master's will and disobeyed. There are two categories of people in the world, Luke 12, 47 and 48. Those who know God's will and disobey it, and those who don't know God's will and disobey it, among the unbelievers. Now, those who know God's will and disobey it are going to get a severer punishment than those who don't know God's will and disobey it. So, ignorance of God's will does not mean we can escape the judgment. But God in mercy, even though we deserve judgment, does not judge us, but overlooks the times of ignorance. And Paul says God showed his mercy 
because, Paul says, I acted ignorantly in unbelief. God's mercy is abundant in areas of our life where we are ignorant of sin, but we cannot presume on his mercy when we go on sinning willfully. That's very clear in Hebrews 10.26 that for those who go on sinning willfully after they have understood and received the knowledge of truth, there is no question of coming back to Jesus Christ and asking him to forgive us each time. It's one thing if we slip up and fall occasionally. It's quite another thing if we choose to continue to sin willfully after we have understood the truth. That's a very serious condition. So Paul says he was shown mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. And not only mercy... See, this is the emphasis in all of Paul's writings, as we saw when we considered verse 2. That when we come to the throne of grace, we read in Hebrews 4.16, we first receive mercy for our past failures, and then God gives us grace for the future. Mercy deals with the past, and grace helps us in the future. And so he says, the grace of our Lord, verse 14, was more than abundant. That grace forgave him, and that grace strengthened him. To live in victory. And that grace of our Lord was more than abundant. What did it mean? What does he mean when he says the grace of God was more than abundant? In Romans chapter 5, towards the end of the chapter, he uses that phrase, where sin abounded, or sin increased, Romans 5.20, grace abounded all the more. That does not mean, as some misinterpret it, that the more we sin, the more God's grace covers our sin. If we sin in ignorance, certainly God's grace covers it, but what it really means is that however great the power of sin may be in a man's life, however much it may have increased to dominate his life, grace abounds above that and can help him to overcome even the sins by which he has been dominated. Because the purpose of grace is to free us from sin's dominion, Romans 6.14. So the grace of God was more than abundant in Paul's life to free him from the power of sin, along with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And that is the faith in Christ that is inspired by this reception of God's mercy and his grace and love towards God and men, which is inspired by God's mercy and grace. Faith and love are two important things that Paul speaks of in relation to wholehearted Christians. We read in Ephesians chapter 1 about this. He says in Ephesians in chapter 1 in verse 15, For this reason too I have heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. A strong personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a love for all the saints. This comes through Christ Jesus as the branch abides in the vine Faith and love are produced in our hearts. And he goes on to say in 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement. It's a statement worthy of all acceptance, deserving full acceptance, he says, a, a saying that can be trusted, a true saying, a, a reliable message, and which is worthy of wholehearted acceptance. Everyone in the world needs to accept this fact, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now here is a statement concerning the purpose with which Jesus Christ came to the world. It was not just to forgive sinners, but to save sinners. Now I trust we understand the difference between forgiveness and salvation. To be forgiven is just that God does not hold the guilt of your past life against you. And that's important. That's mercy. And we need to begin there. But Jesus Christ has not come into the world merely to forgive. Forgiveness is but the first step. But to save sinners. And that means to be pulled out of the pit of sin. If my son were to disobey my instructions and fall into a pit which I had warned him about on the roadside, from that pit he can cry out and call me, and when I come and see him lying in the pit, he can say, Daddy, forgive me for what I have done. And I can forgive him for his disobedience, but still leave him in the pit. I have forgiven him, but not saved him out of the pit. Now, Jesus 
is called Jesus. We read in Matthew 121, the first promise in the New Testament. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Whom shall he save? His people. From what? From their sins. Not just forgive them, but save them. So this is a trustworthy statement. It's 100% reliable and true, Paul says. He's experienced it himself. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And everybody needs to accept this fact. And Paul says, if you want to know proof of that, I am the chief of sinners. Such a great sinner like me. Jesus not only forgave me, he saved me so that I am free from sin's power now in my life.